Hello and welcome to the second proper episode of my podcast. This is a gloriously sunny day and I am cooped up in here like a gremlin, sinking precious hours and minutes into this thing that I hope will be, you know, a thing. Ladies and gentlemen and everyone in between, I hope those of you that did listen enjoy the first episode. I was vaguely planning on other stuff to do this episode. I couldn't strictly find a creator shout out at this point. Not anything that sort of required, hey, it's there, it needs help. The main thing that I do want to do is to say that last week's shout out, Emily Inkpen, her Kickstarter was successfully funded. Still needs to go to a stretch goal, but at least it's a thing, it's funded. So, instead, I thought I'd briefly take you for the first bit of this podcast through some of my bookshelf, because believe it or not, I am, since I was born in 94, I existed before ye old Kindle period, so there's lots of things that are in my bookshelf and are sort of physical books, and I've never quite gotten over physical books, because let's face it, we like physical books, we like physical things. Audiobooks, I'm a bit balanced on, but physical books, I really like them in my hand. So, to take you through a few of them, I think one of the ones that's, I suppose, interesting uh, feature of my bookshelf is that there's a blend of fiction and non-fiction, and my fiction is split into two categories. Stuff that I just use for business example, say, Battle Royale, and stuff that I actually enjoy reading, like in the country of the blind. So this book is not out of this, it's non-fiction and it's Letters and Papers from Prison and it's a compilation of writings by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. For those of you who don't know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer is a important modern religious uh, figure and he rather unfortunately and tragically lived during the Nazi occupation and rule over Germany and he was executed by the Nazis in the very last days of World War II, so just a few days away from potentially having been rescued by the Allies. I don't normally go for this kind of thing. I picked it up from my grandfather's books shortly after he died, and we inherited most of, pretty much all of his library in some way or another. And the letters in here uh, a combination of diary entries, letters he had smuggled out of prison, and other little bits and pieces. It's all very interesting to read through, and let's see if I can find something in here to uh, regale you with some of his wisdom. He is speaking from a very European branch of Christianity standpoint, so some of this stuff might not be in accordance with the beliefs of those listening, but it's, it's, ah yes, here it is. This is a diary entry from January the 14th, 1944. I am sitting by the open window with the sunshine streaming in almost like spring. I take it for a good omen, this lovely beginning of the year. Compared to last year with all its troubles, this year can only be better. I am getting on all right. I find it easier to concentrate, and I'm, and, and, and I'm enjoying Dilthe very much indeed. Dot 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 dot. Um, there's. I, mean, I don't. I don't think it's all of it. I think it's very much a selection of stuff from Bonhoeffer, and I wanted to use him as a quote for something for one of my pieces of work, but that never really happened because. As I said, he's very European Christian, so it's very much from his point of view, his perspective. You, you know how it goes. A different book that... I actually bought this for a piece of research that's only briefly referenced in one of my uh, books in my Helena series. I'll probably tell you about that sometime. Edward III's Round Table at Windsor. It's a interesting little non-fiction book, and... It's about a place called the Round Table Building that was created by Edward III of England, obviously. Well, naturally, not obviously, or naturally, because there's lots of Edward III's. But the point is that he, he was very into, 
I suppose you might call it a medieval chivalric revival of sorts. This was, well, not even a revival. This was the beginning of the movement of chivalry that was later properly codified in things like Chrétien de Troyes' um, Lancelot stories. Yes, Lancelot was a fictional creation. Do not steal. <laughs> um, the thing about it is that it's an incredible building that was never finished. It was intended to be a literal round table with seats for the king and all the knights around, sort of on the inside in a round shape, but it never got finished and eventually got taken down, knocked down, bricks recycled. And it took quite a bit of archeological digging to find it. There's a whole Time Team program on it. And this is a book that is based on the research that would go on to form that Time Team program, which I just think is so cool. I do like a lot of Time Team. I especially like the ones that go a little bit strange off the deep end naturally, like the um, Warburton Field where they find pretty much nothing, or Llegadwy where they debunk the whole site as a phony. Um, it shows that archaeology is not just finding spectacular things, although that happens. I mean, that is, there is that episode where they found four temples in one field. Another one, which is a very much more recent acquisition, is Japan Demonium, and it's the translated yokai encyclopedias, uh, encyclopedias of Toriyama Sekien. Now, I'm a bit of a Japan buff. I, I mean, I'm not, I don't think I would count myself as an otaku in the classic sense, but it's definitely one of those things that I have a great liking for. So I have things like, yes, I have the Ghost in the Shell anime. I may have a manga or two. But one of the things I like is their folklore and uh, mythology, religion. I think it sort of straddles the line in between. But Sikien was someone from the Edo period who basically codified most of what we know about or what we visualize about yokai. And uh, you have to read it from right to left, because obviously. But the classical image of the Jorogumo, the, um, you know, the spider woman, or as it's translated here, spider bride. And it's really interesting because y there's a beautiful vision of a, a woman who seems to be in classical dress of the period. But then she has spider, four, six rather, spider arms with silk coming out of each one and little spiders attached to the end of silk and trailing about. That's actually an image that hasn't survived into the modern day. But that concept of the spider woman, the literal spider woman, is very much there. And um, Sikien codified it. He also codified things like I mean, a lot of our images pre-big tubby form of Tanuki are from him. Quite a few Kitsune are from him. Most of the object-based yokai are from him. He is, well, he, he's, he's one of a tradition, I suppose, that can expand worldwide of people who do an effort, make an effort to codify lots and lots of different creatures, beings, folklore remnants that otherwise might be lost to history. At this time, Japan was wanting to be... The Edo period was the start of a, per... of a time when belief in the folkloric, in the odd, in the strange was sort of shifting a little towards the, we really don't want to believe in this stuff. It really properly got going in the Meiji period and the sort of transitional, transitional time just before that, where Japan really wanted to be seen as cultured and Western, emphasis on the Western. Uh, but yeah, and it's wonderful because this is uh, the Japan Demonium is the first full um, translation of Sikian's works into English. And it was wonderful I managed to find it. I got it as a Christmas present. Oh, go back to the books I've got in my bookshelf. Let's see, what's another one? I've got a couple of books of um, stories here. There's Celtic fairy tales. There's also just straight fairy tales, which is versions more akin to Brothers Grimm than anything you might see from Disney these days. 
there's also a few art books uh, blah 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 yeah it's it's interesting really because even though I don't t particularly take inspiration in terms of story for some things like Dragon's Dogma or Persona I really do like having the artwork in here although there is a wonderful a uh, this yes this is one that I like Journeyman the art of Chris Moore and if you don't know who Chris Moore is then you will have seen his art he is a prolific artist for science fiction for fantasy and he has a very specific smooth style uh, you'll you'll know what I mean when you see it try hunting out um, if you want to see his art find the um, you know sci-fi masterwork reprints there's a lot of the covers of that are by Chris Moore and I actually met him by accident on the very first Bristol Con I ever attended and he told me this wonderful story about when he did the art for the sci-fi re masterwork republishing of Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep which uh, by Philip K. Dick which was the adapted into the film Blade Runner he had to create something that was yeah, enough like that great big ziggurat building in Blade Runner but not so much that it would run into copyright issues so he had the interesting and also I'm not I don't know whether I haven't actually read Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep because Philip K. Dick doesn't agree with him, me that much it may be because I've read the wrong book by him I read Friends from Frolics 9 I think that's what it's called it, it, it was an interesting book but not entirely my speed in, you know how it goes anyway there's my bookshelf there are so many little things here and it, there's even one here that uh, I got at the Bristol Con before last uh, by, by a book by Graham Austin King The Law of Prometheus and it's not entirely my speed it's a little bit dark and violent for my usual tastes but it's got a really interesting spin on what causes magical powers and I think I vaguely get why it's called Law of Prometheus if you don't know the context of the story then the title will seem to make no sense at all but um, yeah I'm sure that's one of those things that will be sort of understandable or you could just find it a nonsensical title that was made to grab opinions I enjoyed it and uh, well I enjoyed it for what it was and it was something that was there something that was kind of a thing that I enjoyed like you do sometimes you just find a book and oh I enjoy that and then you might not read it for a year 10 years 20 years or even ever you, you just don't know and Lord Prometheus is one of those um, there are a few like that but I can't think of them off the top of my head honestly I could go on for hours taking you through all the different books in my bookshelves it is bookshelves help I'm, a, I'm an author I'm, I have bookshelves but I don't think that would be as interesting to some as it might be to others. I could also talk about other things like the cheap ways some characters can get thrown into things for drama's sake. I mean I don't have much investment in it but come on couldn't you have given Ken from Street Fighter 6 a somewhat more original um, evolution of his life than his life is ruined by being framed for terrorism that's just so cheap. I, I don't think they even have writers there they have AI generators at, right now. That's another thing um, AI generators, they're a thing now. They are very definitely a thing. It's... Ugh. I mean, I have the feeling that it'll probably blow over to the point of having um, restrictions in place. It'll never go away as a problem. There will always be that problem. But I, I've got a feeling it isn't the whole doom and gloom thing. It's definitely a problem. I'm not saying it isn't a problem. But as, as long as we raise enough stink about the problem now while it's not serious and get restrictions and laws put in, it won't become a problem later on that is too big for us to sort out. So uh, there's my hot take. AI is a problem and we should actually talk about it so it doesn't become more of a problem in the future. That's probably the coldest take ever. Something that is there in the back of my mind and probably need to bring out is that as a writer it can be tempting to 
put yourself in boxes or to potentially think, oh, I can do anything I like, I'm just a writer. But there is limitations on what you can do as a writer, whether it's through your sensibilities or through your wants and needs or through the kind of things you are willing to write, because I would not want to write something like, say, Ghost at a Watchman or uh, or Law of Prometheus, that's not quite what I might uh, fear of writing. But it's a hard truth I've had to come to admit is that there are some stories that I want to write that have been done so often before that I just don't feel like I'd be able to do them justice. For instance, there's a story that I've had for ages that is based in a post-Ragnarok world. I've been calling it something like Valkyria, um, sort of as close a rendering as we can get to the Norse version of what we call the Valkyrie, Valkyries. But Norse mythology is so used and abused, and this was well before Santa Monica Studio got in with their big mood, um, it becomes just cheap to use it again. It's one of those things of, oh, it's Norse mythology again. And I know people have done great spins on it before, even though it's uh, ironically one of the most used mythologies and religions in the world for a myth religion and mythology for which we have no pre-Christian sources, even though it's a pre-Christian belief system. Help! Um, but it's one of those things that I start writing it and then I think, this has all been done before. Why am I bothering? And it's, it's not like I haven't done things that are derivative. I mean, oh no, and nothing's new in fiction. But it's a case of how often has this been done before? And when you get to that point, you realise Norse mythology's been done beyond death. It's been done into the halls of hell and back again. And you kind of lose your imagination and impetus for doing something like that, you begin to feel a little flat, which is not a pleasant feeling. I was starting to feel like that with the project I'm working on at the moment, which is a fantasy trilogy based on Welsh versions of Celtic mythology. And Celtic mythology has also been done quite a lot, but I realised not from the Welsh angle, not properly from a Welsh perspective, because the different branches of Celtic folklore, we tend to focus in terms of their bits and pieces on Irish and Scottish, because they're the ones that survived mostly intact, from what I can tell, and that have really big outsized presences. But when you think about Welsh Celtic folklore, there are so many things. I mean, they have great variations on the fairies. They have a mysterious, sickly yellow mist thing called the Fad Felen. Um, I'm pretty sure I'm pronouncing that wrong. I am terrible at Welsh pronunciation, even though I live in Wales. Apologies, Wales. But there's also the fact that I was thinking about this and I realised I was putting an awful lot of um, rather English terminology into it and not actually double checking some of the Welsh I was using. So I did that and now the story's moving along just great. But it's uh, famous last words. It's one of these things that hits you and you realise, I can't write about this. And there's also the other thing that you could have that could happen is that, am I qualified to write about this? Am I actually qualified to write about, say, African folklore? And personally, I think no. I want to, I want to try, but I don't feel that it's right for me to do that because I'm from a very European background. I do not have the cultural background knowledge or the uh, potentially the resources available to make a good job of it. So though my protagonists are ethnically diverse for lack of a for want of a better descriptor, I don't think I could say write a story about Anansi or about all the other different deities and spirit, or deity equivalents, spirit equivalents, those kinds of things that come from 
Africa, the different parts of Africa. Egypt is a bit different, even though it's part of Africa, that's a mythology, religion and culture that's been it's extinct for thousands of years. And even though that is no excuse for gods of Egypt, gods of Egypt is a sin and should be obliterated from our minds as, ra as rapidly as possible. Like it's just blech. But um, it has less problem, le problematique territory to accidentally stumble into with the whole colonialism angle, the problems of the slave triangle, which scholars are still wary to talk about today. The fact that um, it was a two sided arrangement in some areas and the fact that this culture needs representatives from its own people. Otherwise, it could be seen as a form of co-opting. It's a problem that you also see in cultures like China. And China has its own problems at the moment. But we also have authors from the, those regions that are writing about that culture and giving it to the world, like Xi'an Jie Zhao, apologies if I butchered their name, is writing about aspects of their culture, but giving it their own twist and also taking pieces of it that modern China is kind of leaving behind and leaving to fester. And they're, they're allowing it to live in the Chinese diaspora and also in the greater public consciousness. And if you're wondering, Jian Zhao is the writer of a um, science fiction story called Iron Widow, which is basically a loose retelling of the life story of Wu Zetian, who is the only female emperor in the entire history of China. And if you want to learn a bit more about Wu Zetian, the historical figure. Jiran Jie Xiao also has a YouTube channel where they do history of various aspects of Chinese, um, well, Chinese history. Their history on the highly bisexual um, Han dynasty of China, which is the second imperial dynasty after the Qin dynasty, I think I'm pronouncing that right, just, um, is very entertaining and educational. And when I check their sources, then the sources are accurate. They tend to be accurate. It's nice because there are some channels like Overly Sarcastic Productions, which I really enjoy. It's very interesting. But when I hear their member Blue summing up the wives of Henry VIII and he falls into the trap of so horribly oversimplifying the complex and tragic relationship between Anne Boleyn and Henry VIII, like completely, completely skipping over the fact that she had a traumatic miscarriage and he had a life-changing jousting injury the year that their relationship went sour. He just skips over that and he just picks the meme route. And there's being funny and then there's falling into traps and there he fell into a trap, which I think many a historian has fallen into in the past on purpose or otherwise. It's, it's, you know, it, it's one of those things. It's It happens, but it's annoying when it does, especially if for a denizen of the country that Anne Boleyn was a queen of for a period of time. I had intended to do more with this episode, but frankly, I'm not in the best of health. I'm coming out of two back-to-back -back colds, and I gave myself sunstroke, and so this is mostly a rambling episode talking about this and that and what's it. Hopefully, at the end of the next couple of weeks, I will have found something to talk about in a more concise and scripted way. Hopefully you haven't been bored to death by my ramblings. And I'll see you all next time. And anyone who does listen, thank you for listening. It makes so much of a difference just to get out there in some degree. Anyway, see ya! was, um, I mean, at this time, um, uh, uh, blah, blah, blah. Oh, I'm so glad I'm working on this on Wednesday and Thursday. This is just for anyone who's bothered listening to the end of the episode. I started working on this with a reasonable amount of time. I'm not recording this all on the day. Uh, thank goodness, because I've got a headache, a sunstroke from walking a dog. Oh, uh, well, well, <laughs> Uh, let's go forward with it, shall we? 
it's a problem that happens, is there. It's a problem that someone like, that happens, that, that, that I've done it again. I mean, her history of the a very bisexual emperors of the Wu, Di not the Wu dynasty. Oh, I've not done it again. When I check her sources, I've done it again. Verify and yeah, she, she does her, re she, I've done it again. If you're wondering about the, some of the weird outtakes, when I'm talking about Zhu and Zhe Zhao, their preferred pronouns are they, them, and I'm automatically, without thinking, ending up using she, which is not right, so I needed to correct myself. <laughs>